March and April and May, all through the end of that. Um, uh, Phoebe began her career, her educational career at Cornell College, where she earned her Bachelor of Arts degree in biology. She earned her uh, PhD at Harvard University uh, in microbiology. And then she joined the faculty at Colorado as an assistant professor. Um, uh, Dr. Lostro has a uh, number of external grants from a number of uh, uh, funding agencies. She has a very long list of publications. Uh, and one of her most notable ones is she is the author of a 2019 textbook on the molecular and cellular uh, biology of viruses by the CRC Press. So uh, she is a authority on viruses. And so um, since she's done uh, a lot of work uh, on the uh, uh, pandemic and the epidemiology of it, uh, she's uh, very well qualified to tell us about the molecular biology of this little virus. Uh, she is a fantastic person. She is a very strong advocate for diversity and inclusion. And she served on the uh, American Society for Microbiology's task force uh, for diversity, equity, and inclusion, and a similar task force uh, at the National Science Foundation. She is a fabulous mentor to undergraduates. She's trained 100, over 109 undergraduates in her lab, sending them off to graduate school, medical school, law schools, and a host of other cool careers. Um, she is a um, amazing funny person. She is a, a uh, comedian also uh, performing on Science Riot and she is an amazing soloist. So she is a well-rounded person that does science uh, and everything else. So if you would join me in giving her a very warm welcome uh, to Dr. Losto. She's going to give us, I know, a great seminar. So welcome Phoebe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rita. Um, thank you so much to your department. It is a great honor to be here today. I'm enjoying myself so much. I enjoyed talking to the graduate students and postdocs, and I even enjoyed talking to the faculty. So that's all <laughs> to the good. And, um, and so, yes, yeah, so I'm going to tell you about coronaviruses. So my idea today was that um, all of us are inundated with um, people asking us questions about COVID-19 because of the circumstance. So I thought that I would focus on giving you um, zingers to share with those folks who are part of the conspiracy theory crowd who don't believe in COVID-19 as a serious problem. And then I'll delve a little bit into the molecular biology just to give you a taste of what fascinates me about these viruses um, so that then you can follow up on your own if you want to go more into the molecular biology. If we have time, I'll talk a little bit about antiviral drugs and antivirals. So we'll see if, and um, viral evolution. So we'll see if I get there. Um, I am going to attempt to share my screen. Let's see what happens. So far, so good. Do we see it? Okay. Oh, there it you is. You can see a portion of my screen. And now I'm going to start the slideshow and move which portion of my screen. Oh, escape. I think I want to do presenter view. There we go. And I'll change the proportion of the screen that you can see. This is in the advanced feature of Zoom, by the way, for your Zoom aficionados. Um, OK, so can you see my cover slide? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So um, this is, uh, you can see my affiliation. If you'd like to contact me after the talk, that would be great. Um, and you can see a painting of SARS coronavirus 2 by David Goodsell, who is a molecular biologist at Scripps. And he uses known stoichiometry, microscopy images, and known protein structure image, um, known protein structures to create um, beautiful paintings that are also scale models of microbes. All right, so for the talk today, I'm going to talk to you about um, coronavirus, um, molecular biology, and medical technologies. So I'm going to talk about how the virus replicates, 
I'm going to talk a bit about immunity and vaccines. I'm going to talk about um, antiviral drugs, and I'm going to talk about viral evolution and SARS coronavirus too. But before I dive into all of that, I'm just going to go over a little bit of the context about SARS coronavirus 2 disease, which we know as COVID-19. Okay, looking at my clock. Okay. So SARS-1 happened from 2002 to 2003 and was a major crisis in health and healthcare. A lot of the people who were made sick by SARS were healthcare providers because it can be transmitted through the air just by examining an infected patient. And uh, as you can see from this graph, we are looking at the number of SARS cases on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And this uh, horrible epidemic killed 8,000 people in eight months. Um, and we always, we virologists always thought, oh, we escaped a big one there. It's a good thing we did a good job with that. And now that we've been through SARS, then we know what to do the next time. Well, we all know what's happened with that story. So um, this is the cumulative number of confirmed global cases of COVID-2 at this point. And I'm going to close out of this PowerPoint presentation so that I can show you this amazing animation of the cases growing through time, which you can see at ourworldindata.org. Okay, so let me get that and then I'll pull, I'll move the focus of the um, presentation. Okay, so you're going to see the world and then continents, North America, the European Union, South America, Africa, China, and Oceania. And then you're also going to see the United States over time. So cases are here on the y-axis and this is a linear scale. So here we are when it started, January, February. You can see that it moves out of China into the European Union and then North America is starting to rise, mainly driven by the US. You can see South America coming up in the spring. Here we are in the summer. This is the second wave in the US. Late summer, back to school. Here we are in the fall. Okay, and almost up to the present. And here we are up to the present day. Okay, so we are nowhere near getting to the final accumulation of global cases of um, COVID-19. And um, I often get asked, yeah, but who cares because no one's dying. So I thought I would show you um, an animation of the excess deaths um, from all causes compared with previous years. And we have good data for the United States. So I'm just gonna show the United States. Okay. So in this graph, you're looking at deaths that are uh, more than, uh, so this is um, mortality on a given date. I think this might be by MMWR week, I'm not sure. And you'll see the average number of deaths in any given week. It turns out you're more likely to die in the winter time than in any other time. And so you'll see that it's higher in the winter, but um, you will see the excess deaths that are occurring in um, 2020 because of COVID-19. So here we are in January, May, August, September, October, November, okay? Notice that this graph is about two months behind and that's because it takes two months for deaths to be reported accurately and recorded accurately in our major public health databases. So this excess mortality that you're seeing in spring and summer is very likely to occur this winter to some extent, but we just don't know the extent of it yet because first of all, it's still winter time. And second of all, it takes at least a month for 80% of deaths to be reported accurately to this um, Centers for Disease Control um, database. Okay, I'll go back to the PowerPoint and move the window so that you can see the, um, the correct part of the screen. All right, so obviously this is why everybody's newly interested in coronaviruses. Um, COVID-19 is deadlier than influenza, so if someone tells you that it's not, they're wrong. Um, here's the direct comparison for so that you can um, share it with other people. So the last influenza pandemic that we had was in 2009, and that's the only influenza pandemic that has occurred in the post-genomic era where we were sampling patients and sequencing the, the virus as we went along. In that case, there were 500,000 global deaths and 12,469 deaths in the United States. Uh, the most recent pandemic before that was in 1968, and that caused 1.1 million global deaths and 116,000 U.S. deaths. And I think you would agree with me if I say that healthcare in the United States, and specifically supportive care for people who are in respiratory or cardiac distress, has much improved since 1968. So let's compare that with COVID-19. 
as of November 29, there were 1.46 um, million global deaths. There were 266,000 deaths in the US alone, and there were 62.5 million infections globally. And we have not even really completed the first year of the virus um, once it uh, left China. So um, a lot of people want to compare to the great influenza pandemic in 1918-19. Now, most of the data that we have on 1918-19 comes from the United States because there was a war on and not everywhere was keeping great statistics. And uh, the US kept better statistics than a lot of other places. Um, so globally in 1918-19, 33% of all people caught influenza and 2.75% of the population died from it. Um, in the United States specifically, 25% of the US population caught it and 0.65% of the population died from flu in 1918-19. So if we were to see a disease of this magnitude today, we would see uh, 2.6 billion cases and we would see 217,000 deaths. So right now, coronavirus, uh, COVID-19 is only up, only <laughs> up to 60 million cases and 1.5 million deaths. Um, similarly, in the United States, if we were to have an infectious disease of the same scale as in 1918-19, we would see 82 million cases and 2 million deaths. And um, we are not near that yet with, with COVID-19. Um, but we certainly don't want to get there. And we can estimate what might happen in the United States depending on how many people in the uh, population end up getting infected because the current case fatality rate in the United States is 2%. And so if 5% of the US population catches it, that's 328,000 deaths. If 10% of our population catches it, that's 656,000 deaths. 20% uh, would be 1.3 million deaths. Now this is in contrast to typical annual deaths from our top um, causes of death. So heart failure is the number one cause of death in the United States, and that causes 655,000 deaths a year. Cancer is the number two cause and kills about 600,000 people a year. The only infectious diseases on the top 12 list of um, causes of death in the United States are, is um, influenza in combination with pneumonia. And influenza and pneumonia typically cause 60,000 deaths per year in the United States, making that the eighth highest cause of adult mortality in the United States. So um, COVID-19 is well on its way to being among the top um, causes of death in the United States for 2020 and possibly even 2021. If you'd like to learn more about influenza in 1918-19, I often get asked what the best book is to read. This is my current favorite one. I believe that it does the a better job covering all available global data, including data outside of the United States. So it's called Pale Writer and it's by Laura Spinney. There's also a wonderful online archive of old newspaper articles from 1918-19 and it's a comprehensive archive of every newspaper article they could get their hands on from the United States about influenza. And you can read exactly the same stories <laughs> that you're reading in your um, local and in our national newspapers today. It's exactly the same battles going on as though nothing has changed in 101 years. So. Um, you can look at the primary data, but there are also these wonderful historical essays on, at on one city in every state. And you can see they compare and contrast like what happened depending on which mayors shut things down or left them open or who had a gigantic parade and who did not have a gigantic parade and so on. Um, so anyway, I highly recommend this um, database and especially the essays um, written by historians about selected US cities. Okay, that's my epidemiology background for now. Does anybody have any questions before I continue? And you might have to unmute yourself and speak up because I can't see all of you. Phoebe, what would you say to those that would look at that data and say, um, I don't believe that's the correct data because all the time hospitals are assigning death from COVID to patients that merely died and would have died from strokes, heart attacks, uh, um, pneumonia, um, and they think they're getting, the hospitals are getting paid more money and therefore they're listing COVID. 
Yeah. So thanks for that question. Um, so, you know, we're all getting questions about these conspiracy theories right now because we are the scientists that everybody knows in our communities, right? So first of all, um, it's just not true that hospitals or doctors make more money because of some one particular cause of death or another. So I can't even, I can't debunk that part of the conspiracy theory because it's just not a fact. Um, as far as the cause of death, coroners and um, other people who certify deaths are, there's very clear procedures to follow to assign a death to one cause or another. And there's a principle both in law and in medicine called but for. And the idea is that if somebody would have been alive but for COVID-19, then that was a COVID-19 death. If someone would be alive but for a heart attack, then it was a heart attack while someone had COVID-19. And so there's very clear, um, clear rules about how uh, medical professionals arrive on those statistics. And um, the cases, uh, the deaths that are being attributed to COVID-19 would not have occurred except that that person had COVID-19. They may also have had another condition, but they would still be alive today had they not been infected with COVID-19. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's do some biology. Um, so I'm going to talk about the replication cycle of the virus first. All right, so this is a diagram of the structure of the coronavirus virion, which is the extracellular infectious particle. It has several prominent proteins and its RNA genome. So all coronaviruses share this same structure. The S protein is the spike, which is, of course, the spiky thing that sticks off the surface and that gives this virus its name corona because um, to the people who first saw it, it reminded them of the corona surrounding the, the sun. E is for envelope because the membranous structure surrounding the nucleic acid on the perimeter here is known as an envelope when a virus has it. And so E is for envelope. It's one of the proteins in the envelope. The nucleocapsid is, the, is known as the N protein. Uh, nucleocapsid proteins uh, bind to genomes. And in this case, the nucleocapsid protein is the little gray ball that is uh, packaging up this genome, which is comprised of RNA. And then there's also another protein in the, matrix, in the envelope that's called matrix or M protein, and you can see it's diagrammed here. Um, so that's it. <laughs> I mean, that's a pretty small number of proteins to have killed as many people as have been killed by this virus. I continue to be amazed that, um, and, and this, this virus can actually express more proteins. It can express around 20 proteins. Um, but even so, it's still amazing to me that not just one animal, but millions of animals, human beings, can be killed by such a simple uh, biological microbe. So um, this slide is taken from an annual reviews article and shows you kind of from top to bottom and left to right the flow of activities inside a cell when a coronavirus has entered that cell and replicated in it. And so virologists consider the first step of virus replication to be attachment and entry, which is up here in the, in the upper left. And after attachment and entry, some coronaviruses um, um, uh, enter through endosomes and some enter through direct fusion at the um, cytoplasmic membrane. And it might depend on which host cell you're investigating, whether you, uh, which entry mechanism the virus exhibits. So then um, after entering, uh, the genome is released um, and there's a process called uncoding where the RNA that makes up the genome of this virus becomes available to the translation machinery. So this is a little blob of a ribosome. And actually this coronavirus RNA, part of it can be translated directly when it is released into the cytoplasm. And that translation on the ribosome leads to production of these very strange gigantic polyproteins which are um, many thousands of amino acids long and which have to be proteolytically digested in order to release individual proteins that then have activities that the virus needs to go on in order to take over the cell and replicate within the cell. Um, any uh, virally encoded proteins that are not found in the virion itself are called non-structural proteins or NSPs. And there are quite a few of these NSPs and together they collaborate to take over the host cell and trick our immune systems so that the virus can replicate and complete its cycle. So once these NSPs are synthesized from the entering genome, there's a process by which the virus takes over the membrane system of the cell and creates little replication compartments, actually gigantic replication compartments. I'll show you some images soon. And inside these replication compartments, there's a lot of RNA synthesis going on. So there's synthesis of molecules known as antigenomes. These are complete 
copies that are complementary to the plus strand genome, which then can be used to make new genomes. And then there are um, RNAs that are smaller than the whole genome. So there are some that are complementary to the genome and smaller. And then there are some that are the same sequence as the genome and therefore can be used as messenger RNA, but also smaller. And these get called subgenomic RNAs. So that's what the little SG stands for. So the positive sense mRNA-like subgenomic RNAs can be translated, again, to make more proteins. And the goal is to make gazillions of viruses. And so all these proteins, the S, E, M, and N proteins, assemble around the new genomes. And the virus comes together in this kind of membranous system in the cell. And these viruses are a bit unusual for uh, enveloped viruses in that they do not exit the cell by budding. So you may have heard of, for instance, HIV or influenza budding away from the cell surface. These viruses actually assemble inside a membranous compartment that is separated from the cytoplasm. And then this membranous compartment fuses with the plasma membrane and releases the virus particles through a process of exocytosis. So that's actually relatively uncommon with, among viruses that infect animal cells. And then these viruses can go on to infect more cells. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about some stages of the virus replication cycle, focusing on the stages of replication that are important for um, the components of the virus that we hear about a lot in the news. So the first stage um, that we hear a lot about is attachment entry and uncoding because it's mediated by the spike. And you've probably heard a lot about the spike protein. Not only uh, is the spike protein critical for immunization, uh, it's also maybe, uh, maybe the gene encoding the spike is evolving in response to uh, having crossed the species barrier. So I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So um, Attachment entry and uncoding are mediated by the spike host interaction and are critical determinants of both the host range for any virus and tissue tropism. Host range is the different species that a virus can replicate in. Tissue tropism is the different tissue types within a single animal that a virus can replicate inside. And then, like I mentioned, there's evidence that SARS coronavirus 2 may be adapting to humans by altering attachment and entry. Um, through um, selection for variants on the spike protein that cause more efficient entry. And I'll show you those data in a minute. Come on, baby, wake up. There we go. Okay. So this is a general picture of coronavirus attachment and entry. So um, when the virus first approaches a cellular surface, which is diagrammed down here, you know, most of the cells in our body are coated with um, carbohydrates that are attached to the uh, surface proteins. So I once heard a carbohydrate biologist characterize our cells as being like M&Ms with the sugar coating on the outside. And uh, interestingly enough, a lot of coronaviruses interact with sialic acid sugars that are on the cell surfaces. And that's interesting to me because um, those are um, critical for attachment of influenza virus as well. So anyway, coronaviruses uh, usually exhibit reversible binding to the sialic acids and then browse along the surface of the host cell until the spike encounters a protein that it can bind to irreversibly. So there's this irreversible binding step. And then following some interesting proteolysis events that are actually mediated by host proteins, not virus proteins, um, this proteolysis causes uh, the head of the spike protein gets cut off. You can kind of see that. And when the head gets cut off, the spike protein responds to that by rearranging itself in a dramatic way, which is fascinating in biochemistry. I know I'm talking to a biochemistry department, so I just want to say these virus spike proteins that have fusion peptide activity are really interesting if you care about um, protein structure. And if you ever want to teach about protein structure, students are quite fascinated with the idea that a protein could um, fold in a different way, uh, depending on which uh, components of the protein are present or absent. So anyway, this, this massively refolding of the beheaded spike protein leads to fusion between the envelope uh, membrane lipids and the cellular plasma membrane lipids. Whoops. And then what you get is that the um, coronavirus uh, genome enters into the cell. Now this seems to happen in some cell types, whereas in other cell types, the entire virus particle gets uh, internalized to, into an endosome and this kind of cleavage and rearrangement is happening along at the same time um, so that the fusion reaction af actually happens between the um, endosome uh, happens within the, uh, within the happens after the virus has been internalized. So you can see that here where the viral envelope is actually fusing with the endosomal membrane and releasing the, um, the genome. 
So it kind of depends which paper. I think it, it really depends what cell type you use, whether you see the, um, the genome entering after uh, the virus has been internalized into an endosome or not. Okay, so these are some beautiful pictures of that spike protein. And these are crystal structures that are available at the protein database um, site. And I especially like the pages on PDB 101. So this is the envelope of the virus in pink. And this is a component of the spike that they cannot crystallize. So we don't really know its structure. And then here you can see the structure of the trimeric um, SARS spike protein and the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. And an interesting thing about this spike protein that is really important for its function is that there are these little flaps on the top and the flap can either be up or down. So um, not everybody might know that proteins are not static structures. They're always kind of breathing, you know, sort of flexing. And so for this spike protein in particular, there are three of these flaps, which can either be in an up or open position or in a down or closed position. And for the purposes of this drawing, this one has one of the three in the open position, and this one has um, all three in the closed position. But you can see over here in this picture of the same spike, binding to its cellular receptor, which is known as ACE2, that having the flap in the open or up position is essential for this contact between the virus spike and the host cellular receptor, which is ACE2. Okay, so the spike host interaction is critical for determining the host range and the tissue tropism. So in terms of host range, people always want to know, is SARS coronavirus 2 going to be able to infect more than just humans? Okay, so here's what we know. All mammals have that ACE2 protein, and it serves the same function in all of us. Um, what we don't know necessarily is which mammals have the ACE2 surface that binds directly to the um, SARS spike protein. But um, using genome sequences and then predicting protein sequences and then predicting their fold, um, we can uh, predict whether or not the ACE2 protein from almost any, from pretty much any mammal that we know the genome sequence of will be able to bind to that SARS-CoV-2 spike. And so probably not rodents, so that's good news. Um, there have been, there's a recent report about certain marine mammals having an ACE2 protein that could in principle bind to SARS-CoV-2. Uh, probably great apes and certain other primates are vulnerable to COVID-19 infection. And this is a real concern for um, endangered species such as um, gorillas. Dogs can be infected, although they have not yet transmitted it to any humans that we know of. And then minks have been in the news a lot lately um, because a mink can catch it and can probably pass it on to human beings. Um, so what we are wondering is whether COVID-19 is going to get into new zoonotic reservoirs as a result of having spread globally. Um, but knowing the host range also is helpful for developing good lab models so that we can test vaccines and medicines. And um, of course, the host range question raises issues about endangered species. And we need to think about things like um, whether COVID-19 can get into endangered bat species on different continents. So people are working on that. So um, within a single infected person, then where can the virus go and replicate in the human body? Well, a lot depends on where the spike is expressed, or sorry, the receptor is expressed. And this ACE2 receptor is expressed in, um, in um, different tissues in adults versus children, which probably affects the distribution of COVID-19 in the body. Um, ACE2 contributes to regulation of fluid pressure and probably other things because it's found in many uh, tissues that are not thought to contribute to regulation of fluid pressure. So actually, because of COVID-19, we're kind of trying to learn more about what exactly ACE2 is doing in all these other tissues. Um, and then an interesting finding is that ACE2 expression is actually increased by interferon. So interferon is one of our body's antiviral responses. It's produced in response to most um, viral infections, and it causes all of those um, general uh, feelings of malaise when you get a viral infection and you feel sick. That's often due to the actions of interferon and other events that occur downstream of interferon. So, um, so a lot of our information about where ACE2 is expressed in the human body comes from cells or studies where the cells were not necessarily exposed to interferon. So it could be that during a viral infection, ACE2 expression is found in more tissues or more abundantly in certain tissues in the human body than it otherwise would be. And that's something we need to look into. I think it's very disturbing that there, it is often the case that the receptor for a virus is induced by an immune response against viruses. So there seems to have been some evolution where viruses have taken advantage of this antiviral response. Um, evolution is amazing. 
Okay, so then let me tell you about this new finding that just came out of the Korber lab about the variation in the spike protein that seems to be making uh, SARS-CoV-2 more transmissible in human beings. So what you're looking at in this graph is um, on the y-axis, there's the frequency of a certain mutation that changes an aspartic acid or D-amino acid found at position 614 in the spike to a G or glycine amino acid. And when the pandemic started, this variation could not be found in the sequences of the viruses that we had, okay? But then it could be found in some of the sequences in February, okay? And then after a sort of blip back down, it started to appear very abundantly in sequences, in genome sequences from viruses isolated in March, April, May, and June, to the point that in some uh, virus populations, in some patients, um, the virus in their body, 100% of the viruses in their body have um, this D16 to D614 to G change. And this is happening on all continents is what these graphs show. So um, when a single alteration takes over a population like that, that's actually a signature. It's typically a signature of some kind of evolutionary change and can be a signature of adaptation. There are other more sophisticated tests that evolutionary biologists do to look at adaptation, and I don't have time to go into all of them, um, but it does look like this D614 to G change is important for the virus adapting to be transmissible among human beings. So where is this aspartic acid at position 614? and, and um, on the spike protein and, and what could it possibly be doing. So um, there's a nice uh, news feature in Nature recently written by Callaway that explains this. So here's the picture of the spike, the crystal structure that I showed you. And um, if you look on the spike, this aspartic acid or D at position 614 is here on the surface of the spike. Well, what could that possibly do that would make um, that would make this mutation take over the population? So here's uh, some work that was just published in Cell. And so I told you that that spike protein could be, uh, has those three flaps that could either be in the down or closed position or the open or up position. And they have to be in the up position in order for the, um, for the spike to contact the receptor. And so in the normal case, the virus that first uh, uh, emerged zoonotically, there was that aspartic acid or D at position 614. And most of the time the spike is in the closed position, maybe with one of the little flaps in the open position. But if you look at the altered spike protein that now has a glycine instead of an aspartic acid at position 614, what these authors notice is that many more of the spike proteins have one or more flaps in the open position. And uh, they did a whole bunch of work to show that this actually increases the probability of ACE2 binding and of fusion with the cell membrane. So it's increasing um, attachment and entry into cells. Um, and for this functional reason and for quite a few other reasons that, again, I don't have time to go into, it's very likely that D614 to G has taken over the population of uh, SARS coronavirus 2, not just by chance, but because this is actually selected for. Does anyone have any questions before I continue? Okay. So, um, I really care about gene expression because I'm a molecular biologist. Uh, so this is the process by which this one genome uh, encodes many, many proteins and, well, not many, let's say dozens of proteins, and then uh, creates uh, new copies of the genome so that the virus can be assembled. And I'm not going to have time to tell you a lot about that, but I am going to tell you a little bit about how it occurs inside dedicated compartments that these polyproteins that are produced as a result have to be processed and that there is some, there's a lot of interest in whether the replication process is recombinogenic and if so, how it might be. So I think there might be some people in the audience who care a lot about cellular endomembrane systems. Well, coronaviruses, totally rearrange the membrane system inside infected cells and so are really interesting agents to study if you care about the endomembrane system. So this is from a paper by Noops et al. in 2008. They were obviously not studying COVID-19. They were studying a different coronavirus, but all coronaviruses seem to do this inside their animal host cells. So coronaviruses first seem to take over the endoplasmic reticulum membranes and inside cells that have been infected with um, 
corona with a coronavirus these strange things that are named convoluted membranes start to form as well as these pouches called double membrane vesicles i'm going to show you real ems of these in just a minute so this double membrane vesicle is probably the site for rna synthesis and it's surrounded by two membranes as you can tell from the name double membrane vesicle and then these seem to travel through the cell and accumulate moving from the er into the golgi system and ultimately the cells fill up with these um packets that are um, um that are they're, they're, they're separate from the cytoplasm and inside them there will be some of these um, uh, replication compartments and also newly forming viruses so the forming viruses sort of bud off into this interior compartment in the cell after they have assembled so let me show you some amazing pictures of that from this noops paper so after two hours this cell contains double membrane vesicles here's a hundred nanometer scale bar and here's an example of a close-up on this double membrane vesicle and what you can see is this arrow is pointing out a channel so they think what's happening is that the virus rna is being copied in here and then being released into the cell where it can be translated or packaged through this kind of channel um, at four hours, you see more of these double membrane vesicles and some other strange things starting to accumulate, such as those convoluted membranes, which you can see better at this scale. This is a thousand nanometer scale bar. Here's the cell's nucleus. And here's a site of really weird looking membranes that should not be in a healthy cell. And these are all the strange membranes that are accumulating in this infected cell after eight hours after infection. This is another eight hour uh, um, time point where they're doing a close-up and you can see some convoluted membranes with this 250 nanometer scale bar. And then after 10 hours in this particular system, you can see one of these vesicle packets, which is this open vesicle in the cell. And you can see the little viruses starting to bud off into the center of that vesicle. So I think I just said all of that without clicking through my text. So I'm just going to move on. Okay, so what's happening inside those uh, double membrane vesicles is that a genome, which can be diagrammed here, is being copied to make uh, negative complementary uh, copies of it, which then can be used as a, as a template to make new genomes and also to synthesize messenger RNA. So this genome has those polyproteins that are encoded at the beginning of the genome, and then all of the structural proteins such as S, spike, E, envelope, M and N are encoded in the last half of the genome. And this genome has a poly A tail and a normal five prime methylated cap, just like um, a messenger RNA would. So um, this genome can be translated directly by a ribosome. And when a ribosome binds to this uh, structure and translates it, it synthesizes one of two proteins. It either, sur sur uh, um, blah, 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 blah. It either synthesizes this large poly protein 1 through 11, or this large polyprotein, 1 through 16. Now, these polyproteins have to be cut up by a protease into individual proteins in order for each of these individual proteins, in order for most of them to have their actual function. So, um, Um, and an interesting thing that is an object of study is that these two polyproteins are actually synthesized in a defined ratio that is important for the, um, for the regulation of the life cycle of the virus. And if you're into translation, let me tell you, viruses are really interesting for translation because there's a very weird ribosomal event that has to happen to keep this translation working properly. But I'll spare you that since you might not all be into translation like I am. So anyway, after these polyproteins are made, there's a component of each of these polyproteins that is actually proteolytically active. And it cleaves, it cleaves its, these proteolytically active components, cleave themselves out of the polypeptide and also cleave the other polypeptides, ultimately resulting in the production of, uh, I think it's 14 or 15 non-structural proteins, so the NSPs. And the most important thing for our story right now is that most of these NSPs assemble into a replication complex or a replication machine shown here, um, synthesizing RNA using this viral RNA as a template. Okay. Okay, so there are lots of weird viral RNAs inside these double membrane vesicles, okay? There's full-length copies of the genome, 
And then there are also these shorter subgenomic RNAs, which encode many fewer proteins. And it turns out that the ribosome can only read the first of these proteins. So all of the spike protein is synthesized from this RNA. All of the E protein is synthesized from this RNA, the M and the N, okay? The viral RNAs inside the DMVs also include double-stranded RNA, which is, you know, unusual for, uh, for cells. And um, these have a minus strand and a, green, and a positive strand that are complementary and therefore base paired. And these replicative forms are used as a template to synthesize the viral mRNAs. So how this happens is mighty weird, okay? So first of all, cells don't make any enzymes that use RNA as a template to make a complementary strand of new RNA. So if a virus needs an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, the virus has to encode that um, replicase itself. And so I showed you the picture of the coronavirus replicase, and now I've simplified it and I'm just drawing it like this Pac-Man. I don't know what happened to me in the 1980s, but to me, uh, viral replicases are Pac-Mans. I don't know why, it's just how it is in my imagination. So when I drew this for my textbook, the replicase has copied the very end of this template, and now there's secondary structure throughout the genome. And some of these secondary structures are stem loop structures. So there's one, and they're called TRSs. It doesn't matter why they're called that. But they're very similar to one another. So that when the um, complementary strand of RNA binds to one of these loops, this uh, sequence is actually the same as the sequence of this loop, and as this loop, and as this loop, or very similar, and to this loop. And so when this replicase is going along, in a process that is really not well understood yet, there's discontinuity in synthesis. And what will happen is that the RNA base pairing here and the replicase pro um, protein will somehow skip over some of these and jump to the end and base pair to this thing near the end and then complete replication, okay? in discontinuous RNA synthesis. So um, this uh, jumping reaction then will produce different amounts of the smaller um, RNAs that are needed for the virus to complete its life cycle. And there are lots of major knowledge gaps about this really fascinating form of replication. So for instance, we don't know why the coronavirus replicates, we don't know the mechanism by which the coronavirus replicates specializes in um, making uh, the different amounts of each of the RNAs that are in those DMVs. Um, and that's really, we know that if the amounts are perturbed, the virus replication cycle is not normal. So clearly controlling the ratio of each of those different RNAs to each of the other ones is very important for the virus. We have no idea what the mechanism of that is. Um, we don't know what the regulation of the replication case is to synthesize the messenger RNA or plus sense RNA compared with the complementary strands. We don't know how that's regulated. And then there's another strange thing. So coronaviruses, um, when you, when you go out and sample a bat <laughs> or a primate and sequence a coronavirus uh, and compare it to the, all, to the known sequences of all other coronaviruses, you will often find genomic signatures of recombination. Uh, by this, I mean that part of the genome seems to be descended from one group of coronaviruses, and another part of the genome seems to have completely different ancestry. Now that's a sign of recombination. Now everyone thinks that something about this strange jumping reaction that happens for discontinuous synthesis of uh, coronavirus RNAs is probably involved in the recombination that we observe through genome sequencing, but to my knowledge no one has ever observed uh, recombination happening in the lab, and we know nothing about the molecular mechanism of coronavirus rep, uh, recombination. Now I have a feeling that's going to be an important thing to figure out because um, COVID-19 is caused by a coronavirus that shows signs of um, having arisen through recombination. Okay, I could talk forever about that replicase and about weird translation, <laughs> but I'm not. Uh, instead, I'm going to tell you uh, just a bit more about um, about coronavirus, uh, other aspects of coronavirus molecular biology. So when I took virology as an undergraduate, there was this weird anomaly that no one understood, but that everyone agreed was weird. And here it is. So what I've diagrammed for you here is um, the, just a scale with uh, nucleotide one versus nucleotide 30,000 at the other end. And these are just the, this is the relative size of um, viral genomes. Um, that are similar to coronavirus genomes in that these genomes are plus sense RNA, which means they can be used by a ribosome to, uh, as, mess as though they were messenger RNA, okay? And tobacco mosaic virus 
polio virus, rubella virus, yellow fever, hepatitis C virus. These are the smaller plus sense genome um, viruses that infect animals. And they pretty much all have a genome that is 12,000 nucleotides or smaller. And then there are almost no known viruses of human beings that have anything between 12,000 and 30,000 and also have this kind of genome. And yet the coronaviruses have a genome that is 30,000 nucleotides or even longer. And so this has long been very puzzling because all known RNA dependent RNA polymerases that synthesize RNA from an RNA template have very high misincorporation rates, which means that the, the virus every time it copies itself is making mutations by making mistakes in copying. And um, based on the activity of the replicases that were known, um, every coronavirus genome should have 15 or more mutations in each offspring genome, and that was known not to happen. So it was always a great mystery, like, why is that? How come they don't have so many mutations? And in fact, you can make a really beautiful graph of the mutation rate for various viruses versus the genome size. Um, and what you find is that um, the RNA viruses are here. And here's some DNA viruses, and here's the double-stranded DNA um, bacteriophages, which have especially large uh, genome sizes. And there's a beautiful correlation line <laughs> where the viruses with the smaller genomes, including RNA viruses, have a higher mutation rate, and viruses with larger, muta with larger genomes have a lower mutation rate. So what this means is that on average, Every virus gives rise to one mutant virus per off, one mutation per offspring genome. Now that is quite an amazing signature, probably of selection. Okay, so coronaviruses are on here, and no one could understand why. Well, in about 2014, people started to figure that out. So um, this is adapted from a 2010 paper by Eckerly's group. So they were studying SARS-1. And um, what they found is what I've explained on the previous slides, which is that it has a typical rate of mutations per offspring genome. It's about one. Okay. But if they made a mutation that screwed up this gene encoding a protein called NSP14, they saw an almost eightfold increase in the number of mutations per offspring genome, which was the first suggested, the first evidence really, that coronaviruses maybe were doing something active to reduce the mutation rate. And um, this was really a crazy claim when it first came out because it implies that the replication machine that is copying RNA for this virus is kind of similar to the replication machines that copy our cellular DNA, which have an editing function that removes mistakes as the copying happens and let the, lets the enzyme start again um, to try to get the right, um, the right nucleotide incorporated the second time. So to make a long story short, it has turned out that this viral nanomachine that copies viral RNA has um, editing functions. So that if this nucleotide is a C and the next nucleotide should be a G, but accidentally the, um, the viral replicase adds an A, well, that's a mismatch. And now this viral replicase using the NSP14 protein and probably others actually recognizes that it made a mistake, removes that mistake, and then tries again to move on, which keeps the, replication, which keeps the error rate just as low as the error rate for, um, that is needed um, for there to be only one mutation per offspring virus instead of more mutations. So the mystery is in the process of being solved. So there are lots of things we still don't understand about this machine. So um, for instance, we know that coronaviruses encode, um, uh, nu they express uh, nucleic acids that look just like a normal messenger RNA, which has uh, a five prime cap and a poly A tail in eukaryotes. Well, that's weird. How does the replicase know when it's sequencing a plus strand versus a minus strand and when it should cap and tail them? Um, NSP13 uh, is uh, not shown as part of the machine, but it has activity called helicase, which might confer processivity on the enzyme complex. And sorry, this is an advanced slide for you faculty out there. <laughs> I know the students are following along for sure, right? Um, and then um, the selection of template during discontinuous replication is not understood. And then, as I said, how this machine participates in recombination, it almost certainly does, but how that happens is not understood. Okay, the last stage of um, the virus replication cycle is, of course, assembly and release. And so for coronaviruses, they do this interesting thing where they assemble on the um, um, certain, uh, certain membranous components of the Golgi apparatus, and then um, they kind of bud into a vesicle, 
And then um, this vesicle uh, fuses with the plasma membrane and releases these new virus particles by exocytosis. So we know that this requires the M and N proteins and that it requires host proteins such as the cytoskeleton for trafficking and um, that they exit by exocytosis and not budding. Um, now in the case of COVID-19, the SARS coronavirus 2 is probably spreading through the human body by cell to cell spread without ever becoming extracellular. Now that's too bad uh, because when the virus is extracellular, it can often be accessed by antiviral defenses such as antibodies. But if the virus is spreading from one adjacent cell to the other without being found in the extracellular space, things like um, treatment with serum cannot be effective. Um, replication will eventually kill the cell, although not by bursting the cells open, but simply because uh, the vast majority of the cell's metabolic capabilities are taken over by virus um, replication. And so there's not enough energy or protein and nucleic acid subunits left for the cell to maintain homeostasis and the cell will die. Okay. So let me finish up with some uh, more medical topics because um, you might be asked about these things in the next month as you are talking to your family by Zoom instead of in person for the Christmas holidays. So I'll talk a little bit about immunity and vaccines and antiviral drugs and maybe one minute on virus evolution and then I'll finish up. I know it's been 42 minutes so you're all already super patient. Um, Rita, if I'm going on too long, just jump in and tell me to stop. So um, SARS coronavirus um, 2 manipulates human immunity in ways that are not well understood yet. But we did know um, for a long time that many coronaviruses um, confer short-term immunity rather than long-term immunity. So we're not sure if SARS coronavirus 2 causes lifelong immunity. It might, it might in some people, um, we just don't know yet. Um, but herd immunity is probably achievable through immunization. Herd immunity, by the way, is only achievable for any infection through immunization, not through natural infection. So this is just a diagram from my book sort of going over how, um, how the human body uh, reacts to uh, influenza virus and mounts an immune response. And I'm not going to go through all these things in detail because um, that's just not the point of the talk. But um, probably many of the same defenses against influenza virus are active against uh, sars cov coronavirus 2, and all the things we understand about uh, influenza virus and comparing and contrasting with influenza virus are going to help us move forward in understanding how the human body reacts to COVID. Okay, so it amazes me that in 2020, we understand the basic theory of immunology so little that we cannot predict whether a kind of vaccine strategy is likely to be effective or not. We have to make a vaccine and test it. I just think that this is amazing. It also means we microbiologists and immunologists are employable. So, you know, that's all to the good. Um, so we do know that some pathogens are very adept at evading or manipulating immunity, and it's harder to make a vaccine for such pathogens. We definitely need to understand more about immunology, and we lack some vaccines that we really need. <laughs> So we lack a universal influenza vaccine that would protect us from all influenza strains. We lack vaccines against most STIs. The only good STI vaccine we have is against um, herpes, I'm sorry, not herpes, um, papillo human papillomavirus, the HPV vaccine. We don't have a good vaccine against malaria. We don't have a vaccine against MRSA or even tooth decay. And we need vaccines against these pathogens that are called the escape pathogens that are causing a lot of multiply drug resistant infections in human, um, in, um, in, in hospitals. Um, and we don't have vaccines against any of them either. So there was no way to know ahead of time, like, well, what vaccine should we try? So people try, are trying like hundreds of vaccine COVID, uh, of COVID-19 vaccines. And in general, what we know about vaccines is that the more proteins you include, the stronger there's going to be an immune response. That's the blue triangle. But the fewer proteins you include, the safer it is. <laughs> and so that's the, that's the trick. There's a trade-off between how immunogenic a vaccine candidate is and whether uh, and how safe it is. Okay. So basically people all over the world are doing these vaccines. And um, what's happening now is that some mRNA-based vaccines are moving forward. And um, this is great. And I think that healthcare workers in the United States are going to start to be vaccinated next week. Um, if you want to volunteer to be part of a trial, this is where you go. And um, it's possible that we're going to see widespread immunity to COVID-19 caused by vaccination by the end of 2021. 
So these mRNA vaccines are uh, encapsulated messenger RNAs that are inside some kind of proprietary lipid vesicle that the companies won't tell us about. And it appears that they enter the cells where some, for some reason that is not disclosed, the RNA somehow gets out, the ribosomes translate it, and now this human cell becomes a factory to make whatever viral protein is encoded by this messenger RNA, such as the spike, and the body makes this spike or other secreted protein and mounts an immune response against it. So there are two of these that are going to get an emergency use authorization or EUA very soon. There's one from Moderna and one from Pfizer BioNTech. So the one from Pfizer is the one that is rolling out in the UK starting next week. Okay. Um, what's important about these is they're relatively easy to manufacture, but very difficult to store and distribute. Uh, the Moderna one has to be stored at minus 20, the Pfizer one at minus 70, but these folks think they can make 50 million doses before January 1. These folks say they can manufacture 50 million doses before January 1. This one's going to cost $25 to $37 a dose. This one's going to cost $20 per dose. Both of them require two shots separated by about a month. Um, vectored vaccines are where there's a virus you know about that doesn't kill us, and you take something like the coronavirus spike protein and make this virus that doesn't kill us express the coronavirus spike protein and then give somebody this altered genetically engineered virus to provoke an immune response. So some of those are in development. That's the AstraZeneca or Oxford one that's in development. Now the good thing about this one is that it can be stored just in the refrigerator. Um, they think they can make 30 million doses before 2021, and it only costs $3 a dose. Yay, that's better. Um, they might get an EUA as early as January. The Sputnik vaccine that's being used in Russia um, is this kind of vaccine, and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is also this kind. Um, the Sputnik and Johnson & Johnson ones are going to cost about $10 per dose. Johnson & Johnson says they can make 1,000 million doses by the end of 2021, so that's pretty amazing. Um, there are a bunch of other vaccines in development, so you're going to hear about them, um, but they're not quite as far along. There's great explainers in the New York Times and all kinds of journalistic outlets to teach you about the molecular biology of what these vaccines are comprised of. Okay. Um, we don't have any good SARS coronavirus 2 antiviral drugs, which is mainly a consequence of having understudied coronaviruses for decades. Um, there's a great news story in Stat News about underinvestment in coronavirus research. But what you want in a good antiviral is um, a molecule such as the one in turquoise that binds specifically to a virus protein and not to human proteins. So what you're looking at here is the crystal structure of one of the SARS-CoV-2 proteases and the second SARS-CoV-2 protease. And then each of these blue molecules in turquoise is an inhibitor that binds to this protease and inhibits it. So everybody knows there are protease inhibitors for HIV. There are actually tons of antivirals for hepatitis C as well. And since the basis of all of these pharmaceuticals being selective and killing the virus more than it kills us, um, is uh, targeting virus-specific proteins. The good news is that coronaviruses present many opportunities for antivirals. So this is a diagram of the um, HCV um, genome and the proteins that it makes. And the only point is that it makes, about, it makes about half as many proteins as coronavirus. And all of these drugs bind to one of these uh, hepatitis C virus proteins and inhibit its activity. And so um, really, when you look at the coronavirus genome, we've got all of the possibilities for all of these proteins that are either regulatory or enzymes that we should be able to find pharmaceuticals that bind to them and that could work as antiviral drugs. And I'm almost done. So um, I just want to say that we don't know whether SARS coronavirus 2 is going to evolve like influenza. So I'll just give you my perspective on that very quickly. So influenza is very recombinogenic, as is SARS coronavirus 2. Uh, influenza and SARS coronavirus 2 both have about one point mutation per offspring genome. But unlike SARS coronavirus 2, there's a lot of, there's high genetic diversity in nature for influenza. We think that there's low genetic diversity for SARS coronavirus 2 like viruses. We know for sure in the case of influenza that the non human animal hosts, especially migratory birds, are extremely abundant. We don't know the abundance of the non human animal horses hosts for SARS coronavirus 2 because that's still disputed what exactly those are. And we know that it's very common in influenza for this for influenza viruses to co-infect the same host animal, and we don't know how often that happens with coronaviruses.
So I'll just say that um, these are the sources that I use to get my information on SARS-2. Stat News is great. The Nature Briefing is great. This Week in Virology is great. And um, for those of you who are looking for the professional literature, the American Society for Microbiology has a beautiful curated resource of important publications that you can find at this link. And um, with that, I will just say everybody looks better with their uh, puppy than otherwise. So that's Bernstein, who's outside barking. And this is my email. And I welcome um, any questions or comments um, from any of you. And I'm going to hit escape and stop sharing my screen so that I can see you. Thank you. Can we put on the video so she can see us for a sec? I think I can see you. Can you turn your video back on? Oh, okay. Turn my video back on. My puppy isn't with me, though. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? So I, I have a question about, like, you know, replication. So is it, uh, is there RNA dependent RNA polymerase? You know, you put a lot of subunits there. Yes. So there, it's an RNA dependent RNA um, polymerase surrounded by many other regulatory and enzymatic factors. And uh, you also indicated some sort of primer there for the replication. Where, where does this primer coming from? Yeah, so that's super, that's a great question. So uh, um, there is no cap snatching equivalent like there is for influenza to get a primer. As far as we know, this uh, replicase machine starts de novo without synthesizing a primer first, which is an unusual feature of um, nucleic acid synthesis for sure. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. There's something in the chat. Hi, Phoebe. Uh, John Gustafson here. I, I wanted to ask you a question regarding mutations, you know, in particular the aspartate to glutamate. Obviously, that's on the spike protein. That's on the outside where the immune response actually reacts with it. But I was curious. I saw 58,000 viruses sequenced on that, that uh, chart that you were showing, that graph. And I was curious, were there any other common mutations that were found besides that? So I'm given to understand that there are some additional common mutations, but that the research story of whether they are being selected for or are random and whether they have functional consequences is less complete than the story about that aspartic acid. So I can't give you any more information about those mutations, but I will say that the virus is evolving and I truly believe it would be to humanity's best interest if we did not allow it to continue evolving. <laughs> and so the way that we stop it from evolving is to stop the infection cycle. Well, everything living is evolving, so. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Phoebe? Yes. Hi, it's Karen. Hi, Karen. Hi, can you put the address on how to volunteer for this study back up? Yeah, Would Thanks you put for it the in question. The chat? I'll put it in the chat, that's a great idea. Thank you for the question. Okay, next. Um, similar to the question about, about uh, mutation and evolution. S so um, the recombination is different than the, the mutation, but they both affect the evolution of the virus. Do you know, is it, I mean, I, you said you don't know much about the mechanistic, but is it mechanistically analogous to influenza recombination? Well, I mean, so this is the problem. It's not just that I don't know about the mechanism right, of recombination. No, yeah. It's that no one, I mean, I know you know that. It's just that no one knows. So influenza is really different from coronavirus in that influenza has a genome that is in segments. And when two different influenza strains infect the same cell, there's a high frequency of offspring copies of those nucleic acids recombining so that you might get seven segments from the bird parent and one segment from the pig parent. And then that gives you a recombinant virus that then can go on to infect a human more, um, more efficiently. Now with coronaviruses, there's only one genome segment inside the virion. So there's something strange happening where these two are, where RNAs are being synthesized uh, from different template sources. To my knowledge, no one is hypothesizing that there's some kind of strange RNA ligation where there's part of one uh, RNA molecule and another part that are somehow like chemically linked together afterwards. Everyone thinks that something's happening during synthesis of the RNA that is causing the recombination, which probably means some kind of template switching, right? Like along comes the replicase copying one bat coronavirus genome, and somehow it falls off that template and then binds onto a template from a different co-infecting genome and complete synthesis of the, of the um, anti-genome template RNA. But like I said, 
said, no one's, to my knowledge, has observed this in cell culture. We just observed that it must have happened because of the sequence of the genomes that we know about. Thank you. Uh-huh. Well, if there are no questions, I have one more question about this uh, cocktail, region around cocktail. So what is this about? Is, is this, uh, um, you know? Can you say that again? I couldn't quite understand what you said. The cocktail that, you know, um, president got and, you know. Oh, the antibody cocktail that the president right. got. Sorry, it's like almost, you know, it's five o'clock for you folks, right? It's time for a cocktail. Um, <laughs> um, I believe that he received a cocktail of monoclonal antibodies that bind to the spike, which are produced by Eli Lilly and um, which are proprietary. So I can't tell you anything more about what exactly they bind to, but I would expect that it would be the spike protein. Um, I think that antibodies and serum are probably going to be most helpful early in an infection when most of the virus is extracellular. I'm concerned that once the virus gets into deeper tissues, there's probably a lot of extracellular, uh, there's a lot of spread from one adjacent cell to the other without the virus ever being found extracellularly. And um, only extracellular viruses can be combated uh, with an antibody response. Thanks for the question. Um, I have a geology question. Uh-oh. Well, it's, maybe it's not exactly, but how old are viruses and how do you tell which ones are older than others? Oh, that's a great question. So um, all um, estimations on the age of viruses are based on molecular clock ideas that we know how long it takes for um, um, mutations to accumulate and thereby can reason backwards because there's no fossil record for a virus, says, uh, I'm saying to a geologist like she doesn't know that. Um, and, and yet we really have not, there are at least 10 to the 32 viruses on planet Earth right now and we really don't know the genome sequence for most of them. I'll say that we know the genome sequence for maybe 10 to the four of them five of them. So I can see my physics friend Barbara looking at me like, that's a big difference, 10 to the five compared to 10 to the 32. So everything I can tell you about virus evolution is based on a very tiny sample of viruses. So as far as how old they are, I don't know. I will say that when you look at the virus sequences that we do know about, at every major transition in life's history, there is an explosion of a certain kind of virus. And the ones that most interest me right now are retroviruses. Every time there's been like a radiation in mammalian history, there is a concomitant explosion in retrovirus diversity. And there are some very interesting things like there's a sort of a, a retrovirus um, remnant in our bodies that controls the production of the placenta. So we could not have placental mammals at all had we not had an infection with a certain kind of retrovirus. And there's this interesting case study in Australia where all the koala viruses are giving themselves a sexually transmitted retrovirus and they're actually speciating, we think, between the ones that have the retrovirus in their, in their genome, in their um, germline versus the ones that don't. If, we don't. if they don't kill themselves off with chlamydia first and or we don't kill them off some other way, we may someday understand co-evolution of retroviruses using koalas as, as an example. So anyway, that's what I would say. They are as old as we are, if not older, and probably different viruses have different origins. Probably they don't, all viruses don't come from the same place and don't have the same evolutionary history. Thank you. Hey, Phoebe, this is Lance. We have a question for you. Okay. Uh, we were wondering, how long does it take from when the uh, coronavirus enters a cell to the, uh, to the replication where it starts to distribute them out of the cell? Yeah, that's a great question. So it depends on the coronavirus and on what cells you are studying, but it probably takes between one and four days. And usually there's... Um, I think it's on the order of thousands to, to 10,000 offspring viruses for every infected cell. Big numbers. I think they might be my youngest audience. <laughs> Lance and his boys. Hey Phoebe, it's Yu Chao. Hi Yu Chao. Uh, can I ask you a quick question about the uh, exocytosis process? Mm -hmm. My understanding is that for most enveloped virus, they actually need to bud in order for them to obtain the uh, outside envelope. I'm just wondering, in this exocytosis process, how would this contribute to, 
I don't know, the life cycle of the coronavirus versus... Yeah, the- yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So they seem to be getting most of their lipids from the Golgi system, although I'm not convinced that we've studied all coronaviruses in detail enough to know whether that's true of all coronaviruses or just kind of the best studied ones. And then they carry those membranes with them when they form the virus particles inside the um, little vesicle packet before the exocytosis event occurs. Um, I haven't read anything about this, but I wonder if the exocytosis does something to contribute to intercellular spread. Um, But that's just a guess that I'm throwing out there. And um, I know that medications and pharmaceuticals that block budding do not interfere with the exocytosis step. I do not know whether the same machinery that's needed for budding, the escort machinery, which is is also used for um, release of the virus particles into that virus packet. I'm not sure if, I, I know that I don't know that, somebody probably does. Thanks for the question, Dr. Bao. Thank you. Uh, see, the, uh, for coronaviruses in general, is it known like how, uh, what the motors are that would move them around and help them in the excit- exocytosis? That's a great question. I have not read any specific publications addressing exactly which motors or even which cytoskeletal components are definitely involved in the exocytosis reaction specifically for coronaviruses. The coronavirus that's been studied the longest is probably MHV, murine hepatitis virus. So if it's known for any coronavirus, it's probably known for MHV and or someone has already just posted a paper on BioArchive about this and SARS-2. Thanks for the question. Well, if we don't have any further questions, uh, would you join me in thanking Phoebe for a really fascinating lecture? That was really awesome, Phoebe, Dr. Lipstrom. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope to someday visit Stillwater in person. (laughs) We would love to have you. I will come breathe the air with all of you and see you in person. And thanks to everyone else who tuned in too. And, And thanks, Rita, for sharing that I, letting me share with my friends and family so they could come here the the talk hey guys. appreciate it so, thank you yeah. oklahoma state thank you. <laughs> thank you. okay i guess i'll go take care everybody breathe your own air okay. thank you bye-bye thanks phoebe Hey, Melissa, did you, uh, what did you think? Hey, Melissa, how, 